Welcome to the Rio Conventions Pavilion, Mr. Nakachi, your pavilion. Um, and you must be delighted with the attendance that you've had here on your special day, the Certification Day. Yes, indeed, it is encouraging. Uh, even the, the high-level panel roundtable that we have, it's also encouraging. It, it calls for more action towards, uh, you know, uh, increased awareness raising. As we know, uh, you have heard it, the evidences that we are seeing at the grassroots level, the success stories, we still have a gap between them and what is being done in policies. So, yes, I'm pleased to see the attendance and I hope that those who have attended, that they will be, may I say, message multipliers. There seems to have been a problem in the past in really getting out the message of how serious the certification is. Why do you think that is and do you think the situation is changing? Do you think that more information is getting out there to the general public? Well, uh, it, from the beginning there have been some misconceptions regarding what desertification is about. People still believe, unfortunately, that's why we must really further push for awareness raising. People still believe that desertification is about desert encroaching on our, on our land. If we believe that, it means that we don't feel accountable for what is happening. Desertification is not about the desert, the desert encroaching. Desertification is about us misusing, mismanaging productive land and turning them into desert-alike conditions. I call it man-made desert. So that is one thing that we must further push to bring uh, you know, all stakeholders to understand. But there's also an issue of advocacy. In government, uh, it's most of the time only about ministers of environment or sometimes ministers of agriculture concern. It shouldn't be just their concern. Investing in restoring degraded land and avoiding degradation is actually a very good investment. Number one, for poverty eradication. Number two, for food security. Even energy security and water security depends on that. But in addition to that, you can have sustain inclusive growth unless you tap into the potential for restoration. So what I'm pushing here is the understanding that combating desertification has nothing to do about the desert. Desert are natural ecosystem. We have to care for them as well. But combating desertification is precisely measured by how we prevent degradation and to what extent we restore the grid land. And the rate of it will tell if really we are uh, heading towards the, you know, the right target. That's why here we really expect that head of state and government will commit for a land degradation neutral world, that they will bring this to bear in the outcome document here, because then, only then, we will be able to monitor uh, commitments and that may not be any more lip services. Okay, and I guess it's about five days until we have the final day of the Rio Plus 20 summit. Last night, uh, the Brazilian government released a sort of draft document. Are you, are you confident there is going to be enough uh, information, there is going to be enough emphasis on land degradation in that text? Well, we still have uh, uh, a couple of days to go. Uh, the draft documents uh, have shown some progress, but we're not there yet. So, as you know, in negotiation is not done still it is, you know, governed and said it is so decided. So we hope that next week leadership will step in because head of state and government will be here. Leadership will step in and they will really provide the drive and say, hey, we are not heading in the right direction, that uh, even the world peace depends on this. We, they, will, they may bring up the point that the fact that Eight out of ten of the ongoing violent crises are happening in the dry land of the world. No one will say it is by accident. Most of the time, the root causes are about the, the quest for productive land and, and water. It is for survival. And any additional uh, cause just, you know, set the issue on, on, on fire. So, yes, I hope that leadership will step in and that we will have a real commitment. We need the we commit. We commit, we commit to target, we commit to reach, to build a land degradation neutral world. Even carbon neutrality depends on that. You can't go carbon neutral unless you go land degradation neutral. At least one third of the solution depends on sustainable land management. Even in the land-based economy, that percentage is much more higher. And, and they, they, they will certainly be mindful that 
land degradation is about life degradation, and land restoration is about life restoration. We know it, we have seen it, the population has been striving to do it. Now it is the responsibility of leaders to enhance the grassroots level movement and scale it up and disseminate it and bring it to bear into our overall move for sustainability. Is this an issue that affects the developing world more than the developed world? Is this an issue which uh, requires more input from a developed world, more research, more investment, uh, more funding? Well, funding is all uh, often uh, referred to as an issue. Yes, it is an issue, but it is efficiency in using resources. When you think about the fact that a number of initiatives are undertaken in the silos, what we need is to have converging action, synergies in addressing land and soil issues. And where synergies is so evident is in, the, in the, about land restoration, landscape approach to, uh, you know, to address the issue. Two billion hectares of land out there that are degraded forest land and agricultural land still hold potential for restoration. It is an enormous avenue for, for, for investment, for growth generation, for inclusive growth, for uh, sustaining the, 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 the required uh, um, you know, uh, increase in food production and on. So uh, in the developing world, yes, what is needed is, of course, the access to technologies uh, and to knowledge. Sometimes the knowledge is to be shared south-south. Sometimes the neighboring country, sometimes the neighboring community has made some important leap towards what is needed and sharing that knowledge. In Niger, in Burkina Faso, we have seen farmers speaking to farmers and sharing with them their success stories, also their failures. And this has helped to, to, you know, to generate a grassroots level movement that some people call farmer managed natural regeneration and some other call it agroecology, some call it you know, uh, agroforestry. Whatever name it bears, we have those lessons. Scaling them up is important. Disseminating is important. Sound policies for that. When you think about drought, well, we know to predict drought. Why should what is predictable still, you know, claim lives? This is a major issue of policy failure. So we must team up to ensure that drought preparedness and risk management will prevail over crisis management. And this is feasible. This is possible. This is at least underway. We have teamed up with WMUN and FAO and other UN uh, uh, institutions to organize next year in, in uh, March in Geneva. Uh, a high-level meeting on national drought policies. We do hope that a roadmap will be agreed and that the drought-prone countries will you know, shift away from risk management towards preparedness. A final question. In Durban, you talked a bit about hoping that Rio might be an opportunity for various agencies to, in your own words, get out of their ivory towers. Do you, in what way do you see this could be achieved here? Because there are so many UN agencies here. There's so many people involved in what looks like the same journey, but perhaps they're going on their different routes. What, what opportunities are you hoping to see here to create those synergies that you were talking about? Well, one lesson that we, we have learned, and I hope I'm not the only one who have learned that lesson from Rio, is that synergy will not happen by accident. If, you know, synergy is not incentivized, it will not happen. How do we incentivize synergy? By clearly defining the destination. And regarding land, we need to define the destination. The, the, what is the destination? The goal and the target. And then you will see convergences. So, yes, I believe there have been a number of valuable partnerships. And you, the, the panel this morning has been showcase of partnerships underway. But to incentivize the whole dynamic, we need, you know, clear goal and target. You know, the market is a major agent of change. How do you send the right signal to the market and drive them towards the right direction. Politically and policy-wise, it is precisely by setting the, the goal and the target and providing policy framework and mechanisms that will bring them into the dynamic. That's what we need and that's what we need out of here. We can't afford to wait another 10 years, even to another 20 or 10 years. In 2030, the demand for food will increase by 50%. This will require a, a, an additional cropland of the size of South Africa. Where are we going to find it? Two options. We encroach on the forest, as we used to do, because 80% of forest degradation are due to 
cropland ex expansion, or we put in place a real paradigm shift where expansion will now be about land being restored, land being reclaimed, land being rehabilitated. Yes, Rio plus 20 must live up to that. And I think the, the people who are not here, they, they will scrutinize the outcome document. And I believe that they will find clearly if the summit will have lived up to their expectation.